But uh, really happy to have Dr. Perkins here, and um, he's going to talk to us about live cattle eva evaluation and plus a little bit about some stuff on the ultrasound. So, Dr. Perkins. Thank you, Dr. Mask. I appreciate it. Good job earlier. And uh, he's got the same problem I got. Y'all know what mohair is? Mohair? A goat produces that, right? Joe and I got the same problem. We need mohair. So we're, we're going to keep our hats on and... Uh, kind of go at that route. So uh, I want to compliment uh, Colin Osborne starting out. I appreciate him calling me and asking me to address a topic that's a pretty tough topic. Anytime we get into a room and talk about uh, how we uh, select our spouses, right? We talk about judging cattle and that kind of like selecting our spouses. Some of them like them tall, some of them like them short, some of them like them thick, some of them like them a little more round than others, some like them really skinny, right? Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is how we sort out our front pasture cattle versus the rest of our cattle. Is there a difference? Do you think there's a difference? Cindy, is there a difference in front pasture cattle and the rest of the cattle? Yeah, the first ones I drive up on your place, those cattle better really phenotype really, really nice. We're going to dance here, right? Now, there's some just as good back behind somewhere that if we look at all the pieces and we've got... Uh, ketchup up here. This is ketchup. She's got mustard inside her. If we drive up to her and she's got all the pieces, what separates her from the front pasture cattle to the just cattle that I've got there? What's the difference in those two? Is it she donor quality type? Front pasture? She might be donor quality, right? You probably fed her a little bit different. You probably managed her a little bit different. She might even be halter broken. And that's where Dr. Mask and I might separate ourselves just a little bit. Dr. Mask loves showing cattle. He loves that battle. I hate that battle, right? I just want to go look at a good cow. But I know it's great for kids, and I, that's what I appreciate about the show uh, program. And, and I'm going to show you a slide here probably that kind of goes back to the show ring. How many of you remember that little guy right there? He was so darn tall in those pictures, you couldn't even see the judge behind him, right? And I don't even know what breed that guy is. And then we've got this little short one. You know, in the 1960s when you could actually not even see their, their hocks, they pushed enough hay up underneath them. And then we finally get into some modern type cattle. What drives the cattle industry? And when we talk about evaluating one, what drives that? Is it the show ring? Is it the $50,000 bull that sells at your whatever satellite sale you might be out there? What drives that? The show industry drives too much of it. I'm telling you right now. Right? Because any time we go out there and we see some bad trends in the industry, it probably started because they paid some guy like me to give my opinion about cattle. And we go in there and we sort these all fluffed, puffed, and really nice cattle and we make some decisions that probably work good for the long term of the industry. So I'm going to talk to you about how things, what I think are the essentials, whether front pasture cattle or they're just your cows. What we need to be looking for to make sure we get those things right. And then if you get those right, you don't need to worry about anything else. That $50,000 bull might come. That grand champion show hair from might come. And the best part about it is every customer that buys an animal from you are going to be more than excited uh, to be there. Uh, try to get away from all these things here, though. These fads stay in the middle. Keep it in the ditches. Do not get outside of there. Uh, because if you do, you're going to run into some problems. All right, well, I'll give you a little time to absorb that. How my buddy describes the guilt that beat them in class, the guilt that actually beat them look like this. That's the thing I don't like about shows, right? It does not matter who judged them that day, somebody's mad. You've got one or two people who are extremely happy. Right, Mr. Ellis? And you've got a whole barn full of them are so darn mad at that lady that judged that show that they don't ever want to bring her back again, right? Uh, let's try to get out of those pitfalls and not have those. How about this one? Dr. Mass kind of addressed this one, actually, right? He said that he kind of likes them to look good, right? I think my wife's pretty hot over there. I think she looks good. I like to look good. I don't want to look at her numbers, though, because she's already had a C-section, so her numbers are probably not very good, right? So maybe I'm the same way, Dr. Mask. Maybe I kind of like those two. I kind of, but, but I'm trained in animal breeding, so I love the math part of it. I love the EPD part of it, but also want them to look good. And I really want to put all the pieces together and make sure we get those right. This is where I start. 
How many of you start there? And Dr. Mass actually talked about this. Maybe I can get that to back up. Dr. Mass said that you take all these pictures and the grass is up to their knees, green. You cannot see the feet and legs. Is that the most important part of that female? And we'll look at old ketchup up here. She's got a set of four of them. Are those pretty nice. If I had a set of cows that every one of them looked like that, it wouldn't be in business. I think Dr. Mass just got through trimming on them. That's how good they look. Should we start there? I hope everyone in your room tells me you need to start there. Because if you don't start there, then I don't care what kind of cattle you've got, you've got problems. Anybody seen this picture before? Ask the American Angus Association about this one. Okay, and I know a little about Angus cattle. I might have a few in my pasture. Okay, if you look at those guys, which one of these do we want to produce? Well, how many have seen those right there? Horrible cattle. And I'll concede, you guys have some in your breed, don't you? I've been to some sales where maybe I've kicked one or two out that might have had that problem. Would a hoof trimming fix that problem? Cosmetically it would have, right? But that's it. Been good just for that second. How about these here? Oh, show ring. Show ring creates a lot of these right here. Too straight. All the time. We can always get that. But where do we want to be? Be right in here. We want to be as close to that middle as we can get. Keep things in the middle. Don't get outside and get in those ditches. Because if you can do this, and I'm telling you, the Angus Association has some issues, and they now have EPDs for those. They've already got 45 EPDs already. Why not have 46, right? How many EPDs do you guys have? Anybody counted them lately? 17. 17. You need 18, don't you? Yeah, I think that. Yeah, okay, so we go back down to 17, right? And I think that is a good observation. I teach an animal breeding class at W2. Oh, and I need to recognize one of my students sitting here. Addie, stand up there. Miss Addie Brown, all the way from South Texas. Uh, she's one of my students at WT. I haven't had her in class yet, but I'm going to. So she's going to get to listen to these lectures, right? I teach animal breeding. And she's probably going to be able to answer all these questions when we get into animal breeding. Uh, but when we take and we start looking at these EPDs, how many EPDs do we really need? Do we need 18 of those? Lorenzo just said, I don't need fat EPD. Because if I'm selecting on fat EPD, what happens to me? I get in the ditches really quick. If you make them too lean and you get in that top 1%, what happens to your cow's fertility? Oh my gosh, she goes south, she's not going to breed. What if I go the other end of that and I get the 95th percentile, I get them too fat? What happens? Now i got yield grade fives. How many want yield grade fives? I don't if I'm buying your calves. If I've got a stalker operation, I'm going to buy your calves. I don't need those cattle. I just don't need them. So how many concentrate? Raise the hands. I want to see the hands. How many start from the ground up, look at feet, and make sure they are absolutely perfect? Good cow man, cow man, cow man, cow man. Cow woman, cow man. You cannot be astute cattleman without starting at the ground, in my opinion. If you'll get that right, we'll get the other things correct. This is the other one that goes hand in hand with it. What happens in structural correctness? And again, I see it in the show ring way too often. We make them too straight. We hardly ever go the other direction and get too much set to them, but we make them too straight. What happens when we make bulls too straight here and too straight here? And we can even get this angle too straight. What happens when you do that? Hawks, stifles. What happens when that big old bull goes up and breeds that county and comes back down and he's too straight in the front end? He's going to be crippled in the front end too. There's lots of problems that come with that. None of you should ever be selecting those cattle that are so straight and posty in the back and that the Rex, if you just take the point of the shoulders and go straight down, that's, there's just no angle to that shoulder. None of you should be selecting for that. And if you do get those kind of cattle, can you breed that out of them? I don't have enough calf crops left in me. I'm sitting here thinking I might only have about six more semesters of teaching. Whew, that seems hard to believe I'm old enough to retire, but you know we're there, so, okay? You cannot breed it out. It takes too long. There's too many good cattle out there that you don't need to make that happen. Um, what else do I need to look for if I've got my feet? I've got my structural correctness right. What's the next thing I need to worry about? Do they need to have muscle? Probably so, right? How many of you sell muscle? Everybody raise your hand. Because every calf that you don't sell as a bull or a replacement female, where does that calf go? 
feed yard or stalker operation into a feed yard, into a packing plant, into the consumer's home. If they don't have muscle, what happens? I just, I just told you we had a 12 square inch ribeye on the calf. You got a yield grade five. When you get a yield grade five, what's the penalty for that? Because I bought the calves, right? Make hamburger out of it, right? I lost $200 a head on those calves just off the straight yield grade. You should not let that happen. Where do we find muscle and how do much muscle is too much muscle? Addy, one of my pet peeves is double muscle, okay? So don't ever use that word. Double muscled, what does that mean? Muscle hypertrophy or muscular hyperplasia, right? Do we want that in our cattle? Is that too much muscle? Extremely too much muscle. So you've got to find the fine line where that's going to happen in there. Do I want to look at the form for muscle? That's a good place to look for muscling. How about down the top? Do a pretty good job looking down the top. How about here? This is where I find most people miss this one. Where do we find muscle when we get to the side of this calf? Is it there in that stifle? Or is the muscle down here in this lower quarter? And should it be in both of those? I challenge you to put muscle in both of those. Because what I'm finding is I see some cattle out there, they don't tie this muscle way down into this hock. If I can get that to tie down, there's more pounds I'm going to actually get to sell. And it's really a nice phenotype. It looks good on those cattle. This one is the easiest one for you guys to see, right? You can get down their top and you see that big old ribeye on them. And I contend, even I've been doing ultrasound for a long time, I still contend you do a good job of evaluating muscle down their top. Even though I think ultrasound is probably better, uh, but you can make a good call of that and, and, and do, do well enough. Uh, anybody want to look at this picture and tell me what this bull's doing here? I might have to pick on Steve Emmons here. I'm seeing this a lot right now going on in pictures in all these herd sires. I don't know how they're getting it done. There's some Angus bulls out there. They've got them out front there so much, and they've got this big old, it's almost like they've sat back on their halter, and they've wiped the halter out when they took the picture. I don't know what's going on there, uh, but I don't think that's a, a pretty look, and that's not muscle. Does this mus bull have muscle up here? John Bosman said they better have muscle up there, right? Because that meant that was stoutness. That meant that was testosterone. He looks like a bull. He's masculine, right? You want your bull, boys to look like boys, your girls look like girls, right? Right? In the most parts. How about this one? And I'll probably go back to uh, Mr. Frenzel on this one. Uh, Mr. Frenzel was probably the first one. Actually, I almost died because of this. I remember going into a bull pasture to help him grow cattle and he wanted me to call fleshing ability. What does fleshing ability mean? He didn't tell me the cattle were sick and one of them was down and if you get close to it he's going to eat your lunch. And the pasture was a little bit further along than I could actually get out of. I barely escaped that one but fleshing ability, what are we looking at? What does that mean? It means that I'm putting fat deposits on this calf different places through here with ease, with efficiency, without much feed. Even in a drought, should we be able to have a calf that's got some condition if they have easy fleshing ability? Yes. If you're keeping bulls back that have a fleshing ability, and I'm not saying fat bulls, I'm saying bulls that have fleshing ability, what's going to happen to their females? They're going to be the same way. It's not going to take as much grass or as much feed, and they're still always going to look more like that front pasture calf than that old cow in the back that maybe get a little thin on you but still do you a good job. Can everybody tell me from here across to this shoulder, what is everything else below there? What would that be considered? So I'm going to go from the flank across the point of the shoulder. What's all that below there? Fat, guts, leather, waist. Why are we selecting cattle? And I'm going to show you a picture here in a minute that they're trying to get these as big as they can get them. Is that easier fleshing? Or is that just a bigger room with more leather? Is it an optical illusion? Bigger carcass? Or does that actually get cut off? And does it stay with the carcass? So we're going to look at this picture, try to at least talk through that, kind of what that means. We want them long in the hip, long through the front, but we want them deep from here to here and deep from here to here. 
My contention is, is I want them to be deep in both of these. But once I get down here, I don't want all this extra waste. But I do not want a flank to be up in here. Drop that rear flank, and then if it gets deeper as that animal goes back, and I'll show you a picture where, where that looks like, that's hard to get done unless you've got a really nice female. And I see a lot of pictures of Beefmaster females, and they check this box off. You guys have done a really, really, really good job over all the years of getting these cattle big in the heart, big in the chest, and making them deeper as they go back. That's what makes these cows so darn good in my opinion. You guys make cow factories. And it goes back to all of you in this room because you have done many, many years of making sure that that is right. Now, straight top line, is that important? Pretty important. What's the opposite of a good straight top line? Roach topped, weak in the top. And if you go to South Africa, what do they call that, Lorenzo? You know what they call that? The devil's grip. Yeah, so the devil's grip, and you guys have some of that in your cattle. Uh, I see a lot of females that when they start losing some of that flesh, they get a break right behind their shoulders. Do not keep those cows back. That is not a good thing for you guys to keep back. And I see it in some of your, your cows. So be careful. When those cows start losing a little bit of flesh or a little condition on them, and we get this, it looks like the devil has grabbed them and just pinched them there. Okay, be, try to shy away from those. But we do want long straight lines. And if you go to a show and we hear them say length of spine or it's a long spined animal, is that a good thing? Yeah, because you're selling, what's the most important cut up here? Ribeye. That's the longissimus muscle. The longer you can make that, the more steaks I can get out of it, right? That's kind of the key to it, is what we want to do. Now, this is the picture of a cow that I just loved. And I see Beefmaster cows that look like this. This is a little hairier than yours. Anybody want to know why I didn't put all Beefmaster cattle up here? I know you know, because I told you earlier. I didn't want to take the hits that I picked somebody's cow in here and told how great it was and they could see the brand on it or something. So. And then somebody got left out. So I chose to go this route. You have beef mesh cows that look like this. Matter of fact, you have beef mesh cows that look like this that have something at an advantage, longer fronted. You guys have done a really good job extending those front ends on those cattle. Uh, but I love how long she is down her spine, but I also like where she gets deeper as she goes across here. That's kind of the point of the shoulder right there and gets right here into that flank. That is a really good look, a really broody, nice female. And uh, you guys do a really nice job of getting that done. Uh, and the other thing is, how big a package does it take to get that done? Do we want big cows or little cows? Moderate. You go to my country, it rains 10 inches of rain a year if you want it or not. We've actually been blessed this year and had a little more than that. Okay. When I was in Missouri, we could run only one cow to an acre. My cow could be 2,000 pounds there. At home, probably 1,100-pound cow will kill us there. So, All right, so this is just to kind of depict what is all this mess here. And what have you guys done? And I, I remember classifying a lot of these cattle. If you can imagine this being a beef master, we didn't ever have this void right here in beef masters. Why? What do you guys select for? Not bale navels, but what did you say it had to do? That underline had to carry all the way back to the udder. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That is a perfect thing. So you guys have been selecting for that, making sure that that leather or that, again, it's an optical illusion. Do not be selecting for those bale underlines. How many like bale underlines? How many like a bull? If we put a bull up here, he's got a prepuce here, and he's got a bale in front of it. Do not shy away from those. They're certainly not front pasture cattle. Um, and I raise a breed of cattle that fits that, unfortunately. I raise Charlotte cattle. I guess I probably could, should confess that, too. I was in animal breeding class the other day, and I've got a young man that uh, is a really good cow guy, and he's, this is his second class to have under me. And we were talking after class, and uh, I had made a comment about how I raised Charlet cattle. We had a bunch of old embryos. We put them in a bunch of commercial cows. And the young man came up to me after class, and he said, but Dr. Perkins, you've surprised me today. And I said, well, why is that? I just assumed you had beef master cattle. Why is that? Because that's all you talk about in class. So I'm guilty of talking about y'all's cattle, and, and mainly the cow is what I'm guilty of talking about. Um, this one, give you a little time to study that. You guys know your cattle. 
Which one of these do I need to change in the beef master world? Many times I go and I see cows that both legs come out of the front, same front hole. They go behind a telephone pole and you can't see them anymore. Or a big tree in Tennessee, right? If these two legs are coming out of the same hole, she is two base narrow. And I see some of that going on. They're super feminine. I like the femininity. But we've still got to pull them apart just a little bit here. Don't get to what the pig industry is doing right now and making them so wide through that front end they're structurally unsound. But we got to have some separation here. This you guys do a good job. Y'all have got enough base width in those cattle. Uh, you do a really nice job. But this one I think I would like you to concentrate a bit more on there as you're selecting some of these bulls out there uh, to do a little bit better job there. Uh, this one, is this a good trait or a bad trait? The old cattle splayed out, towed out a little bit. A little bit of towing out doesn't bother me at all. It's way better than towing in, right? So if you can have a little bit, but if we always talk about judging the wheel, throw those straight as you can make those, but a little towed out doesn't bother me one bit. Just don't get them too bad. This one's cow hocked. Do you want them cow hocked when you get behind them? And they have all this curvature to them? Some of my best cows probably are built like that. Not proud of it, but some of the best cows are. They try to straighten those up best you can, but you can take a little bit of cow hock in there, even though the judges don't like it. Uh, can you get too much angle? There's nothing that's perfect. That's basically just basically talking about perfection. Can we make one that is perfect in these angles? If we've got this angle here, should the feet match it? Yes. So if you look at old ketchup up here, and you look at that angle there, should her toes do the same angle? They should. That's kind of uniformity of what you're going to get in these cattle. So if you go from here to here, that same angle will be about the same from here to here. So you start buying your, your cattle and you start looking at these bulls, that's kind of what you want to look for. You can get them too straight and you can get them too much set to those. Once you start getting too much angle here, what happens here? Legs go underneath them, you get them sickle hot. So you just got to find the, the fine line in there. Uh, this one is a really good one here. And again, you guys do a really, really, really nice job here. This is the athletic, functional sound on their feet and leg cattle. You got cattle that go out and move and cover their tracks. You guys have done a really good job of that. And there's nothing better than going to watch a beef master show and look at those big old bulls y'all put out there that still can track and move and extend themselves. Uh, we've got some breeds. I, I'm helping a 94-year-old man, and he's got a cow that weighs 2,800 pounds. He's got a cow that weighs 900 pounds. And everything in between. Does that make sense? 2,800-pound cow. Goodness, she's big. Okay? The little cows he's got, they're really straight-fronted, big-butted, short-coupled. Why do you think he's raising those cattle? He listened to the show ring and he's making what? Show steers for the Texas majors. Has no practicality to the real world. Uh, so if you're winning steer shows in the state of Texas, I'm probably not proud of what your cows are going to look like because they're not going to be functional like this and, and get out there and, and make some, some noise. So uh, This is one students always have trouble kind of understanding why. What does it matter pin set in your bulls? And some of us need to concentrate on this a bit on our bulls. That bull's never going to give birth to a calf, is he? He's going to produce a lot of daughters that do, right? And if we get them too narrow on these pins, what happens to you? You drive up to the ranch and they've got a calf jack hanging close by. You're pulling a lot of those, aren't you? So you've got to be careful when you do that. But widen these pins up. When you widen these pins up, you widen them up down here, and probably you're going to have a little more lower quarter when we start talking about muscle shape. Okay? Perfection. Has there ever been a perfect animal? I'm going to say no. I've never seen a perfect one. 4248, I like that guy. I thought he was as close to perfect as you could make one. But what did he have that I wanted to change him about him? I want to extend that front end on that cab. Man, he was wide and deep and sound and muscular. He had all those things, but he wasn't perfect. I don't know a perfect one out there. And what is perfect? Perfect is the mating system or matching the right bull to the right cow. You have to make those kind of decisions to get there. Again, this is just my pet peeve. Um, and you have not done this, great. What is all of this? 
all of this, all of this, all of this is hair and glue and makeup and nonsense. You guys take hair off of them, kudos to you for doing that where we can see the real cattle. Can that cow be low maintenance? Easy fleshing. Make her a beef master. That's what you should be striving for. Easy fleshing, easy maintenance. Again, I could take several of you in this audience, I can know I could put a cow picture of yours on top of her and it look just like that. And that's probably a Charlotte Maine kind of cross. Do we need power? I hear judges talk about power in females. How do we get power in most females? Make them a free martin. Right? Unfortunately, free martins win shows too often. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about power in terms of a male, but we can have power in a female, uh, but that power does not mean masculinity, those kind of things that we're talking about. Okay? Should we make them growthy? We're caught between two industries right now, and how do we measure growth? Can we take that long bone right there and kind of predict how tall that calf's going to get? It's a pretty darn good indicator. If you know the age and we know what this bone looks like here, cannon bone, I can predict how much bigger this calf's going to get. Uh, show ring gets a little tricky because they change ages on me some, uh, but do we want them growthy? In the carcass data that you just got back on those 47 head, one calf weighed 1118 pound carcass. How big a calf was that alive? It's 62% dressing. That was a large calf, wasn't it? I'd have liked to own that guy. Because I think he was a yield grade three choice. That calf probably made a lot of money. You still sell pounds, you still need power, um, so we still need growth. Okay, don't, even though my country needs a little smaller calf, in general you guys need to select for more. Sleek, this is my pet peeve. Beef Master's been here for a long, long time, and I probably uh, just lost his name, John Newbern. I'll probably go back to John Newbern, gosh, probably 30 years ago, talking about these wedges. They're hard to give them away. Frail means that we have no bone mass. We have no masculinity going on. Females, it's okay to get that, but we do not want that in our males at all. Uh, this one here, I put in here just because I want to talk about this shape here. And I went online and I looked at a bunch of Beefmaster Bull pictures and one particular group is doing a great job of showing the attributes of your cattle, what they look like from the three-quarter view from behind. Commercial cattlemen like to see a ton of muscle when they get behind them at that three-quarter view. Or if you're in front of them looking at the same direction. So try to get pictures that show off the power of muscle that you guys have in your cattle, because you have them, uh, you're just not showing us the right picture. Again, that's a perfect animal, right? That 94-year-old man has a calf that looks just like that, and he said he's perfect, and I think he's perfectly sorry. All right, what do we have here? I'm gonna finish up on what we call phenotype with old ketchup here. Is this important? Dr. Mastis gave a really good talk, and what we want to talk about was what after he got done? Not you being an elite seed stock producer, we want to talk about carcasses and how great that data was. Is this important? How many of you produce calves that look like this? We get a lot of Brahmin cross calves that come to our feedlot at WT, and I see a lot of this. And you know what I tell them it is. Ah, uh, that's just a F1 Brahmin cross. It's not a beef master. I get a good one comes in. Yeah, that's a beef master right there. And I'm not too far off, to be honest with you. Because when you look at those cattle, a lot of them Brahmin cross cattle are falling in this category and even into this one. I want to fall right here. Beef masters do a really good job of getting that accomplished. Um, up here, try to stay in the medium frame there, and you'll hit the industry where we need to be. Is this utterly important? Yes. Some of the best udders I've ever seen on a set of cows are beef master breeders. When you go to their ranch, is that a perfect udder or is that a perfect udder? Certainly not that one. And that, uh, that one's close, but that one's not, that one's not it either. We've got problems. How many of you look at udders and before you buy a bull, do you want to look at the udder of his mother? 
I hope so. If you got that chance, do that because that really is important to, to do that. Uh, put more pressure there. You may not want to put that picture up there. Is there anyone there you want to take out? Front pasture? Front pasture. How about this guy? And I actually found that on advertisement. For, and I hope it's some nobody in the room here because I didn't look at who it was. But this is being advertised as a bull for sale on a Beef Master Breeders website. You're probably better off not showing that picture. Maybe show his sire or his dam as, as well as showing that. So you've got to use your common sense when you're marketing these cattle uh, because it does make a difference uh, when you do that. Does all this put it together and that make a perfect animal? Again, keep the basics in mind and you're going to look at feet, structure, muscle, fleshing ability, and then put a little extension in them and growth. And you can make a perfect animal, right? Keep those basics. I don't care what the rest of it look like. They can be taller, they can be shorter, they can be whatever. But you've got to have those basics in mind to, to make it work. When I was the executive for Beef Master, that's the way I felt sometimes. <laughs> I'd go to some of your places and you say, oh my gosh, this is the best you got, you know? Um, but in general, you guys do a really, really good job. But if you see guys rolling their eyes up or gals rolling their eyes up when you show them your best, rethink your program maybe, right? All right. Let's talk about ultrasound. How many have questions about ultrasound? I can't tell you how many phone calls I get from you guys, and we're going to talk about it. Okay? Is marbling important? Yes. Why is marbling important? Every one of you sell cattle that go to the feedlot. They all go to a packing plant. Difference is they get grounded a Between the 12th and 13th rib. Get paid between the 12th and 13th rib and what they weigh. Okay, so does ultrasound work? I want a show of hands of how many of you think ultrasound works. Okay, a lot of you like that. Okay, how many of you do not think ultrasound works? How many thinks that ultrasound can be manipulated? Okay. If ultrasound can be manipulated, how can we remedy that? And that's what I want to talk about today. So how can we remedy that? Can I make this calf have any more marbling at that 12th, 13th rib than what he's really got? Some? Yes. Okay, so from a management point, I could feed it better. Okay, so I could feed it and I could increase that to its genetic potential. Okay, I'll agree with that. Any other way I can make marbling higher? Lie about the age. Lie about the age, and the adjustment becomes much significantly different. Okay, that does happen. And let's talk about that. Age to ultrasound cattle. What is your technician telling you? When do we ultrasound cattle? Justin? Close to a year old. Close to a year old. Uh, research done in 1992 at Kansas State University said we ultrasounded cattle at how old? One year. Right? 365 days, as close as you can get it. We redid that research just this past year, and what do you think our research said? Between 365 days and 400 days. You're going to get the best ultrasound data to predict what that calf is going to do in the future. So you guys that are not scanning cattle between close to 365 days of age, you're probably not doing the best job you can do. Okay? And I know there's things that go on there why you can't get all of them done at 365 or close to that, but you've got to do that. Now then, are there technology differences? Yes. Okay? I use an Aloka 500, the oldest technology out there. That's what I currently use. It's no longer made. Unfortunately. Because I'm setting my ways and I love it. We're going to have to go to a new one called an Evo, right? Or there's another one called, uh, I don't remember what it's called. It's horrible. 
Because all I can tell you, I've scanned with it. It's big and bulky and it's not, not my style. But we're getting to new technologies. Is that going to change what you're going to get back from ultrasound? It could, okay? But I want to leave one message with you about ultrasound. Because I'm going to bring up some things that you guys have called me about. Okay? What was the quality grade in Angus cattle in 1995? What do you think cattle were quality grading in 1995? In the industry, predominantly Angus cattle were being harvested. How many choice cattle were we getting? Probably a little high, but let's, let's use 55%. Okay? 1995, what else happened in Angus Association? CAB, which told them to do what? Use ultrasound to scan all their cattle. They were scanning over 300,000 head of cattle per year. Only using ultrasound. Let's go to February of 2022. How many prime carcasses do you think graded that day in the United States? 1%, 2%, 4%, 5%. How many of you believe 13%? That's where the industry has gone. 13% prime. That means you've got about 3 to 4% select no roll cattle. How did they get there? With ultrasound. How many of you, how many of you in this room believe that they got there with carcass data? They actually fed cattle out and got the carcass data. I've got one raise his hand. Anybody else think that happened? That's what most of us believe was going on. If you go to their database, they might have 125,000 data points from har uh, harvested cattle. They did not do it with carcass data. They did it with ultrasound. So does that tell me I've got confidence in ultrasound technology? Yes. Every one of you should be ultrasounding your cattle. Every heifer, every bull, every steer should be ultrasounded. If you're serious about changing marbling in your cattle, everybody should be doing that. All your coal cattle, every one of them. It'll be easier to get a technician there if you've got more cattle. Okay? Scan every one of those cattle and you will move the needle in the right direction. Now then, what are the problems? I get a phone call from you guys and said, I scanned a set of cattle, a set of bulls, and I just didn't believe the data. They were all ones and twos and IMF. So I had them rescanned two weeks later by a different technician. May or may not have used the same technology. And be darned, those cattle increased to 5% IMF. They more than doubled in intramuscular fat. Do you believe that happened? It did not happen. It did not happen. Now the first person that scanned them may have gotten it wrong. What would create an animal to have less marbling if they truly had more with ultrasound? Stress, stress was one of them. Heat causing stress. Hydration of the calf itself because if we don't have fluid at the tissue level, at the hide level, I can't get sound waves to penetrate through correctly, right? How about weather? What if it's raining outside? What if it rained the morning before and you scan? What does water and oil do? What if it's dry in South Texas? How much dirt is in those cattle? Did they blow them out? Did they clip them? Did they use curry combs on them? Did they use warm oil if it was cold? All of those things impact what marbling is doing. And your technicians should know all of this. And they should be doing everything perfect so you get the best value you can get. So if they're coming there and they're not blowing them out, they're not clipping them, they're not curing them clean, Hire a new technician. My favorite friend is air. If I can blow those cattle out of all that dirt, I'm going to get a good image, even if you've got a little bit of hair on them. But I prefer to blow them out and clip them if I want to get the perfect image and the best value you can get. Okay? Now then, let's go back to the scenario. 1%, they move to a 4%. I'm going to take this room right here. And we've got a lot of manly men in here, right? And we give them a few drinks, several drinks, okay? And we take them out here and we bring them back in the room. Will they resort themselves? Will there be one thinks he's more manly than another one after a few drinks? 
Probably so. Some will be less, mainly, much more lovable. Right? We re-rank, reorganize those men, right? Does that same thing happen in those cattle? You asked me to scan them today. You didn't like the values. They go in and it's, my gosh, they've got reordered. They're fighting now. A couple of heifers come in heat. These bulls, some of them go crazy over the other bulls don't do. They re-rank themselves. And you tell me to scan them two weeks later. Are they, is there any way they can scan the same? There is no way possible they're going to scan the same. Every one of them is changing either to the better or to the worse, totally re-ranking themselves. So if you get anything from this, stick with a good ultrasound technician, trust your technician, trust their technology, and scan those cattle, and let the contemporary groups do what it does. Do not rescan cattle. If you get a bad set of data, I'm sorry. Change a technician, never use that person again. But do not be rescanning cattle because you are only going to be mad at yourself and you're going to say the technology doesn't work when I've got 30 years of data to prove that it does work. Okay? Quit rescanning these cattle. Quit trying to pin one lab to another lab, one technician to another technician. Do your homework, hire a good technician, stick with that technician, and scan your cattle. Do you see a lot of that? You hear a lot of that? I hear too much of that. Not just in this breed, but in other breeds. And mainly I hear it in Brahmin influence breeds. And I'll just make a comment. I will not tell you. You'd have to kill me to get this probably. There are three labs that you could go to. I work with all three of those labs. I know how their algorithms were developed. One of those labs I would never use was Brahmin influence cattle. Okay? Because what happens, their algorithms were not written with low marbling cattle in there. So when they, their software sees a low marbling cattle, in my opinion, it overestimates it. When it sees a high marbling animal, it gets it right. When it gets one in the middle, it may get it right, it may get it wrong. So what happens to that low marbling cattle that grossly overestimated? You guys start selecting for that bull that they said was 4 or 5% intramuscular fat, which was really a 1%. And you keep him as a bull, and he breeds 25 cows this year. He has 125 before you get done with him. He wrecked your program. Okay? Two labs do a really, really nice job. I don't care what technology they use, which system they use. Most of the systems work. But for your breed, I caution you to stick to two labs out there. And I'm not telling the board of directors to make decisions on the kind of things, but you as breeders, you should manhandle this yourself. Don't make the board make that decision for you. But there are two good labs out there that will get you the right answer. Because most of you want the right answer, right? Except for when I'm selling $50 bulls, and I don't care. He called me a 7% IMF bull. And I'm selling for $50,000. And poor Joe's going to buy him. He's going to make a whole bunch of calves. Is that fair to the industry? Is it fair to that person that bought them? Probably not. Okay? Yes, sir. Dr. Burke, during our summer meetings, we were presented with a scenario where uh, a certain breeder had, had cattle feed <coughs> by two different technicians that reported to two different processing labs. And the, the values of the IMF were quite, quite different. However, they all stayed in the same ratio within the, the contemporary group. So it wouldn't matter on the EPDs, but if you're trying to, to say, hey, I've got a five IMF, but it's actually a two and a half yeah. IMF, it made a difference. But you, you say stick to two, two of the three labs, but how are we to know which two you're referring to? You have to kill me. <laughs> then my last words I'll give you is I'm dying. Right? Uh, I, I will share this probably with the executive and some of those that make some of these decisions, but I would hope that you as breeders don't get caught in that deal where you know, you know that those cattle did not have a seven, that bull did not have a 7% IMF. You know that. And if you went to that lab to get that 7% IMF and you knowingly sold that bull for a lot of money based on that, shame on you. So that's my take on it. You are correct, if I scan the same day, even probably different technicians, even different technology, and I go to either one of the two labs, I'm guessing your rank correlations will be exactly the same. Values will be off a little bit, but if you go to that other lab and you've got lower marbling cattle, I guarantee it will be different. 
you'll get two different answers. And that's what I don't want you to be doing, is getting those two different answers. And those of you who have been selecting for marbling for Clark Jones, I can see, you've probably been selecting for 30 years yourself, probably. Yeah. So he's been safe for a long time, so he's probably got some built-in marbling in those cattle, and he might occasionally get a female that's in that 7 8% and be real. But most of you have got to be cautious, and you're not all there yet. I'm just trying to be honest with you about ultrasound because that's what I was here in my career doing. And I want you all to do it the right way for the right reasons to improve marbling in your cattle. And honestly, I think you've got enough marbling in your cattle. If you see these cattle are killed on these particular cows, man, you're exactly where you need to be. Don't go backwards, don't go, don't go reverse, but gum, y'all don't have to chase this. Just keep it where it's at or better. Mr. Skelton, you got all kinds of data that shows these cattle grade. You've had tons of cattle killed. So don't let this crazy old sound deal marketing get in your way. Okay? Hire a good technician. Call Clay Emmons. Hire a good technician and you'll be okay. Let them decide on the lab that it goes to. Uh, I guess that's all my pet peeves. I better quit talking about that there. So, all right. Any questions? I'll go from there. Mr. Carter. Given the variations that you expressed and some of us were aware of and part of the things that can influence ultrasound determinations of, of marbling. Yes, sir. Would, would you suggest any change in Beefmaster age range of doing this or any further qualifications or adjustments that should be made for cattle that have been fed before they get the carcass evaluation and yep. those that have not would yep. just come off the pasture and so forth. Yep. Great question. How can we yeah. Yeah. how can we make the readings that we get from the various Yep, yep. More yep. Yeah, great question. And I think the question would be if I'm feeding these cattle hard enough that they've met their genetic potential, scan them early. Keep the window where you've got it. But I know that window got opened up wider, probably even under my watch. Um, but if you're taking heifers that you're growing, that they're going from weaning and they're losing weight to yearling, I don't want that measurement. And I've seen that in your cattle. Some of your cattle, you wean them heavier than what they have yearling on. On those cases, they need to be scanned later than 400 days because you need to let them come back in nutrition and growth so that they'll actually express genetically what they have. So those heifers, for example, that are on grass, have not been fed or pushed hard at all, they probably need more time yeah, right. to get that. All we've got is an age range. Yeah, yeah. I think maybe we need some other yeah, uh, you can get it fine-tuned. So based off of if they're in, and I forget, you probably have four management styles, one, two, three, and four. So if they're in this one or two being fed hard, then they need to be scanned before 440 days of age, like Angus has done. If they are feed uh, three and four, where that means they're on pasture or not fed at all, then those cattle could go to 600 days. That gets a little fine-tuned to get that done. But you as breeders, again, I don't think the association should have to mandate that. Right, Mr. Shear? Let the breeders make that decision. And you make that decision. I didn't feed them hard. I'm going to scan them later. I fed them hard. I'm going to scan them early. Got a question I'm back here. What trait or traits do you feel you Okay, what trait or traits do I think Beefmaster still needs to be working on? Yes. Improve upon. Well, when I was here, ever how many years ago that was, um, I always said ribeye size. Always felt like that when I saw a set of kill data that I didn't have big enough ribeyes. Um, I rethought that a little bit. Because now we've got Angus bulls out there that have 20 square inch ribeyes. And you bring your 12 square inch ribeye cow in, it's a perfect ribeye size. Um, so I don't think it's that. I, I think structural soundness is probably the one I always go back to. Uh, you know, we've seen these cattle come out here with curl toes, little bitty feet on them instead of big feet on them. 
a lot of those that were not again Angus is dealing with that right now don't trim them breed it out of them breed good feet and legs on these cattle y'all do a really good job and Dr. Mass probably said it best you're a maternal breed don't try to out Charlay the Charlay you guys have a good product make sure you still have a good cow when that bull gets done because whatever you're going to breed it to is going to give you that good carcass we have the data we have the data that proves that okay don't chase these fabs keep a good sound functional maternal cow market the heck out of her heterosis all day long because heterosis i promise you in the next 10 15 years that's what we're looking for in the beef industry because when you look at angus what's their big concern right now cattle getting to 1500 pounds two weeks before they're going to be harvested and they fall over dead why do you think that's going on too many generations of me hire, me buying a bring an angus bull every year and now i've got inbreeding depression going on what's the best way to get out of that take those inbred cows put a beef master bull on them and it explodes you've got everything that you want again don't lose a maternal focus uh, if i were working on traits yes mr jones back to what mr bill's question was explain a little bit difference in the back pad correlation between cattle and real I think that we look at a lot of cattle that start at 0.15 or whatever it might yep. be that were acceptable in high selection, low choice, then if they're fed to a certain range, how much they yep. change. I think that's, we haven't done a good enough job explaining to people that, that there's a big difference between a, a 4 IMF with a half inch of trim and a 4 IMF with a 0.15 trim. Yep, great question. So the, the, the question is, uh, if we can relate the external fat thickness and or rump fat thickness to what intramuscular fat is going to be expressed. And probably the rule of thumb is, and you, you're kind of touching on that, if I've got a set of bulls and I want to get genetic potential for marbling, what do I have to feed them to it from an external fat thickness standpoint? Someone will give me a, a guess, an answer? A quarter. Three-tenths is what I was going to tell you. Three-tenths of an inch on a bull is probably going to get all the genetic potential for marbling. What if I fed that bull to six-tenths? Okay. If I feed him from three-tenths to six-tenths, I'm going to get a slight increase in intramuscular fat, but not appreciably. If he's at three-tenths, you're probably going to get all the genetic potential that you're going to get out at least efficiently. Okay. Now, if that's a female, what do I want the female to be? Is she going to be slightly fatter than that? Yeah. What do I want that female? Yeah, three, five, four tenths. Okay. So those females, if I've got her at four tenths inches of fat, she can meet her genetic potential for marbling. You don't need to feed her fatter. But if she's at a tenth, you heard her marbling probably because she's got more genetic potential if you would have fed her a bit more. And the key to it in ultrasound, which we never talk about, we never deal with, it's like getting a cow pregnant. Do you want to get a cow pregnant when she's losing weight or losing condition or gaining condition? We always want her gaining condition to get her pregnant. If you're ultrasounding, have her on a plane of nutrition upwards, scan her, and then bring her down. Never ever get her to a point, bring her down, and then ultrasound her. Because she is going to lose a lot of things and it's going to re-rank them. Easy flesh is not going to be hurt nearly as bad as the harder doing cow. So, but three tenths, four tenths is kind of the way I look at that. And getting back some of it. Yes, sir. Everybody just looks at the ribeye. There's a lot of data points. You basically get some of it. Okay. But the selection of the animal is so much as raw fat. So the cells are getting 0.7, 0.8, 0.9. Where do you get nervous that a heifer is not going to All right. So, He's talking about the relationship between rump fat and other other traits. How many of you even look at rump fat? Three of you in the room. Okay, if you're looking at rump fat, what is rump fat in relationship to fat thickness? Twelfth of fat thickness. What is it? More. Okay, so we're going to find more rump fat than we're going to find on rib fat. Is that a true statement? We should if it's the boss indica. So I can scan your cattle and I can tell you what percent of Brahmin genes you probably have in those cattle. How can I tell that? When I measure fat thickness and it's four tenths, I get to the rump, it's four tenths if they are not Brahmin influenced. If they're Brahmin influenced and they took on some of the Brahmin genes, 
they're probably going to be two tenths on their rib and they're going to be four tenths on their rump. Okay? Why do Brahmin influence cattle do that? And there's not enough research out there. We need some research to actually prove and validate this. But my take on it is Brahmin cattle were developed for what type of country? Very hot, very humid, tough country. And if they put all that fat on their ribs, what happened to them? That insulated, they couldn't, they died in Kansas. Uh, I don't remember, Colin, Joe, somebody who talked about that. All those cows died in Kansas, right? Why did they do that? They couldn't get rid of all that heat in their body because all the fat was over their ribs. Brahmin influenced cattle don't put it over their ribs, they put it in their rump. If they don't have it in their rump, they're not going to be as fertile. They're not going to be as easy breeders. Now, how that, I, I think, is the question you ask me. If I've got a cow that's, again, four tenths, I don't want her more than about eight tenths on her rump. And I see some of your heifers out there, not yours, but beef master heifers, that might be 1.2, 1.25 inches of rump fat. That's probably going to extremes. Back in the old sheep days when we didn't cut their tails off, where did they store all their fat? In their tail. They needed that in the wintertime up in the mountains so they had energy to rebreed. That's kind of what Brahmin type cattle do. Uh, but you can drive it too far. Should all of you be comparing that? Fat thickness rib to over the 12th and the last rump? I think you need to at least keep it somewhere in the ballpark. I like them to be slightly fatter in their rump than they are in their rib. That's just me. Can you discuss the uh, gene fertility with the two to one ratio? Yeah, uh, again, this is basically anecdotal. There's no, quote, real science that no one's actually done this. The University of Florida is actually looking at it. So if we take a set of heifers that have a relationship of 1 to 1 versus 1.5 to 1 to 1 to 2, what do we get in most of the pregnancies? Was in the middle of that. So those are in the middle of the road, not in the bar ditches again. You can't, because you get on the edges, you get them too fat or you get them too lean. You've got to stay in that middle is where it's at. But again, there's not enough research out there. I tried to get the Brahmin Association to do this many, many years ago uh, when I don't sound some Hudgens bulls. Uh, the bulls will do the same thing, which is surprising. Those bulls will have a tenth over their rib, twelfth rib, and they'll have two tenths on their rump. So it kind of goes the same thing. Now, I'll caution you that rump fat doesn't deposit like 12th rib fat does. Uh, we did a cereal harvest on some Charlotte Angus cross calves and we fed those cattle for about 400 days. The biggest calf ultrasound was 2,200 pounds. We ultrasound them every 56 days and we killed a subset of those calves every 56 days after I ultrasounded them. In uh, those cattle what happened is their rib fat kept going up, up, up. It never came down on full feed. Rump fat got to a point about the middle of the feeding stage and it leveled off, never got more, never got less. I don't know, we know that Brahmin cross cattle, does it do the same thing or does it just keep skyrocketing and rib fat actually level off? I don't know where it is, there's just not enough data out there to tell me that. But I can tell you that I'm confident that you need rump fat on your uh, beef master or Brahmin influenced cattle to keep the cow in them. That's just my take on it. Good question. Any more questions? If not, I appreciate it. Nice seeing everybody, and we'll be around the next day. Hopefully, you can ask the hard questions. Don't kill me, though, because I don't want to tell anybody that, okay? Thank you all so much. We appreciate it. So.